Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raglan Maddox. I come from the Model Clean in Papua New Guinea. Um, and we have a very, very exciting uh, panel session or presentation and panel session uh, for us today uh, titled Beyond Colonising Data Systems uh, with Ray Lovett, Bobby Ma, Sarah Burke and Janet Smiley. Um, before I begin, I did want to... Do you want to skip to the next slide? Um, please. Before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all calling in from. Uh, I'm calling in from Ghana country, uh, but uh, acknowledge and pay my respects to those calling in from not along the Gambia country as well. Um, being mindful of time and how exciting uh, this session is, uh, kicking off with Ray Lovett on Indigenous Data Sovereignty and Epidemiology, uh, and Bobby Maher on Indigenous Evaluation uh, in Australia, uh, Sarah Burke on uh, Embedding Indigenous Knowledge in Epidemiology, and then Janice smile uh, on beyond colonizing data systems. I'll try and keep this uh, introduction as brief as possible uh, to allow time for, for questions and discussion. Um, as you uh, come across and, and listen to these presentations and if questions arise, please feel free to uh, drop questions in the Q&A uh, function that you'll see uh, on, the, on the screen uh, or the chat function. Uh, and so in terms of process, we'll go through these uh, presentations and then uh, scroll through and go through all the, the Q&As uh, before opening up, uh, if time permits. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass over uh, to Professor Ray Lovett. Ray. Thanks, Raglan, um, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I can see there's about 30, 30 odd, 35 other people here watching the presentation today. So as Ragland mentioned, my name's uh, Ray Lovett. I'm a Nyampa man from Western New South Wales, and I'm the director of the MyQI study. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the MyQI study um, in my presentation, not at the start. But I'm here today primarily to talk about um, how um, Indigenous or concepts such as Indigenous data sovereignty uh, can be operationalized in epidemiological research. So um, that's the title of my presentation for today. So I'm hoping that I can give you some insights into Indigenous data sovereignty and how we do that um, in epidemiological research. But before we do that, um, uh, we need to understand what Indigenous data sovereignty is. Um, and how it's defined. So worldwide, um, not just here in Australia, um, Indigenous data sovereignty is defined as the right of Indigenous peoples to govern the collection, ownership and application of data about Indigenous communities, peoples, lands and resources. Now, um, most people speaking today uh, are involved in Indigenous data sovereignty networks uh, in their respective countries um, as well. And the operational mechanism that we often talk about in terms of uh, Indigenous data sovereignty is uh, Indigenous um, governance of data. So you'll see in this slide on the left-hand side. So how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly in Australia, uh, govern data about them. And then in the middle on the right-hand side, you'll see um, how we're talking about Indigenous data for governance. So that's primarily the two mechanisms of how we operationalise um, Indigenous data sovereignty. So stepping down in under Indigenous governance of data, that's really around uh, how we get to tell the story of our data, not necessarily other people telling that story. Um, and that's primarily our interests there are addressing what we call the Indigenous data paradox, um, where the Indigenous data paradox um, is often what we see and witness uh, in data about Indigenous peoples is it's deficit-based. Deficit uh, we're always referred to in relative terms to a normative uh, population, say the non-Indigenous population. Uh, we're often aggregated um, at the national or jurisdictional level, so we are all the same, even though we come from different um, backgrounds and different groups, different nations. Um, and so that reduces us to a, a very specific data point. So 
with the involvement of Indigenous people in the governance of data, so whether that's administrative data held by government, um, our own data held by community organisations, um, we get to tell more around the data story and often we won't be telling that story um, using those deficit-based modes. On the right-hand side, we talk about Indigenous data <coughs> for governance. So this is about our own development. Um, and Indigenous nations or communities and groups, such as you know, the one I belong to, Nyampa, we are really interested in uh, data that uh, where we're able to deliver our own programs, to collect data on our programs and how, how we're reaching our goals. Uh, but to do that, we also need to develop technical and human resource capabilities amongst ourselves uh, as well. So um, having um, um, data development um, programs and services available within our communities and nations is extremely important, uh, along with um, a process of designing meaningful indicators for what some people call nation building or nation rebuilding. Um, so given the colonial history um, uh, of a lot of the Kansas states, um, it's, it's often um, needing to design indicators so that we can re rebuild our nation. Oops, I went too far, didn't I? This is a delay on this. <laughs> So then we also need to define, well, what is Indigenous data then? Um, if we want sovereignty over this, this thing, uh, what is it? Um, so for us, it's information or knowledge in any format, inclusive of statistics about Indigenous people, and that impacts Indigenous lives at the collective and or individual level. So basically, it's everything. Um, and just to give you an example of, of what that could look like. So it's around our resources or environments, for example. It could be about our demographic, social, legal health profiles, um, but it's also data from us. So it could be traditional cultural information, could be archives, uh, oral literature, et cetera. So in Australia, um, you know, we're, we're not leading the way in terms of Indigenous data sovereignty by any means. Uh, so our Canadian colleagues are probably responsible um, across the rest of the Indigenous world for leading this, um, the development of this um, um, notion uh, and definition. But in June 2018, um, a group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people came together in Australia from community organisations, from policy organisations, um, and we got together with our Maori data sovereignty colleagues to um, define some specific principles here in Australia. And so these are those principles from the Mayan Nauru Bingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective. So we have a website where you can look up these things. Um, so the principles here in Australia were that Indigenous peoples have the right to exercise control over the data ecosystem. And that included all those different attributes of uh, those data systems. So the creation or development of data right through to the infrastructure that houses our data. Uh, we wanted uh, to express our right to data that is contextual and disaggregated. So the meaning, uh, as well as being able to disaggregate the data as far as possible uh, to tell a, a better story that we wanted data that was relevant and empowers sustainable self-determination and, and effective self-governance. The fourth one were data structures. So for those that are holding Indigenous data, those structures we wanted accountable to Indigenous people and First Nations. So even though we may, may not have ultimate control over that data, we wanted a structure that was, or structures. Um, and the fifth is data that is protective and respects our individual and collective interests. So those are the five arch overarching key principles that were developed from that workshop here in Australia. So uh, I'm a part of that group, so, and I was developing the MyKawai study uh, at that same time. So for me, as an epidemiologist and researcher, I thought, well, how do I then take those principles and embed them in the work that I do through MyQI? So MyQI is a longitudinal cohort study. 
um, and it, it essentially just translates from Nyampa, which is my family language, family's language, to following people over time or tracking people over time, uh, which is perfectly appropriate for a longitudinal study. We started conceptualizing the study in 2014 with a six year development process. And we talk about it as an indigenous research um, cohort in that it was designed by, with, and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. And our primary interest in it is to look at information to examine those links between culture and well-being. So culture for us was uh, is foundational and one of those things that in our existing kind of research and epidemiology is uh, absent. Um, and for those that know anything about sort of culture, cultural determinants, um, they are foundational to things like social determinants, or I see them that way. Um, and those things affect health and well-being. It contains both quantitative and qualitative measures, uh, including a, a range of um, demographic and health items, as well as those cultural items. Um, we talked with about 160 Aboriginal people all across the country uh, to develop the different measures and uh, indexes in the survey. So this is really a very short summary of how we, um, and I can't see the top, okay. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so this is a really short summary of how we've tried to do Indigenous um, government, mm -hmm. oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Indigenous governance of data on the left-hand side. So even though uh, the majority of our team in my is Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, um, we have a 12-member Indigenous panel um, and an application process that was developed by that panel from the start. So it took about 12 months where we took apart each of those five principles that I've mentioned before, and that panel determined how they would assess each of those principles for people uh, requesting use of MyQI data. Um, that has formed uh, an application process, uh, which is online for people. If you just Google MyQI study and look at um, the tab on uh, data, you can see um, uh, an application for data. Uh, and there's also, it describes the process of applying for MyQI data. Within that, it was really important um, that we have provisions for what we call operational research. Um, and that's where we might have contract reporting um, or we're doing validation studies of, of our instruments um, and measures that we have in the study. And our more recent one, which we're seeking to do is internal education and training for students and staff within, um, within our new centre. So that's um, Indigenous governance of data. On the other side, we operationalise um, IDS through uh, Indigenous data for governance. So we have about, or, or over MyKawai's history, we have had some 30 uh, community data agreements, which are local partnership agreements, um, which are separate to the MyKawai Data Governance Committee. And that's about community organisations that have engaged with MyKawai to do data collection. They're also able to add questions about their own priorities and um, or we work with them to develop questions uh, that are of local importance to them. And that's really about us uh, repatriating MyQI data back to those communities for their purposes. Um, so at the moment, we have data preparation for specific purposes for a couple of projects that we're running. So one called Yarrabah Counts. Yarrabah is a community in North Queensland uh, where they're wanting to um, they've developed a, a community development program and they're wanting to use different pieces of data from the MyQI survey, but they're administering it locally with uh, local community researchers that we're training. Um, we're also doing some stuff with the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health in, Queens, uh, in Brisbane, where they're implementing a model of care and they're using uh, a patient enablement um, score or measure in addition to MyQI data. Um, so those, those agreements are outside our data governance committee and they're a partnership between the communities um, so that they get their data back for their purposes. 
As a part of our arrangements, we provide data literacy and practice short courses uh, to each of our partners so that they are then able to take their data and use it. Um, so we prepare the data sets for them in that fashion as well. I'll hand over to Bobby. Oh, geez, that was quick. <laughs> Uh, so hi everyone, um, my name is Bobby Ma. I'm a Yamaji woman from WA, but my links are up to go up as far as the East Kimberley to the Gidja people through my grandfather, the Pilba regions through my grandmothers and the Nuwa nations through my pot. Um, so I'm currently a PhD student here at the, the centre, the National Centre for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Wellbeing Research. And my PhD is exploring this notion of collective capability as a way to recenter Indigenous ways of knowing, doing and being in evaluation practice here in Australia. And at the moment, I'm currently interviewing, um, sorry, currently analysing data, in, um, data from my interviews with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge holders. And it's been really clarifying uh, for me that there is a need for this work. I also do want to acknowledge the work that other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are currently doing in this space of um, Indigenous evaluation and just acknowledge their contributions um, to, yeah, to this space. So currently, um, there are these questions around what works, what doesn't work in relation to Indigenous uh, health and social outcomes. We're currently seeing um, that there's a focus of Indigenous evaluation practice shifting to centering Indigenous epistemologies and methods, decision making and participation. Um, and really what the literature is drawing out is that the work of um, like the Indigenous evaluation strategy as well highlight a lack of specific methodological approaches that are appropriate for evaluation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander programs, services and policies in Australia. We also see that evaluations are predominantly situated uh, in settler colonial paradigms. When we come to the sort of the focus of epidemiology and evaluation, EPI um, quite often draws on experimental designs for evaluation purposes, uh, which aligns with these settler colonial notions of um, monitoring, auditing, controlling and surveillance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it is this location of power and privilege that keeps Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people invisible and voiceless uh, in these structures and processes of evaluation. So I'm reflecting, um, you know, currently with my data analysis, I reflect on um, something that a knowledge holder speaks about in relation to evaluation. So they think that evaluation is still a very judgmental, is still a very measuring and judging sort of tool and that people are afraid of it. It's still looked as, as a bit of an audit. So I think for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and what has come through the, the data as well is that there's this sense that evaluation is becoming a bit boring and tiresome um, in that we are continually uh, required to mould ourselves into these neoliberal models and approaches um, and that actually Indigenous ways of knowing, doing and being um, are actually not valid. So I think this is a really exciting space uh, that I'm working in um, and exploring this notion of collective capability is a way of dismantling some of these neoliberal approaches. Um, it's about actually acknowledging and centering the importance of relationality and context as a way of improving the, met the methodological quality of evaluations. And also, uh, we want to address the power construct as a way to build this platform for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership, participation and decision making 
as, sta as standard features for Indigenous evaluation in Australia. So the idea uh, that evaluations will be uh, for, with, by and as um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that we can really start to build the evidence base that is relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander life worlds and priorities. Sorry, Sarah. That's all right. Shall I start? Uh, Yama Malia. Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Sarah Burke. I'm a Gidja Daragamurai woman, born and raised on Ngunnawal Nambri country in Canberra. And I'm going to be presenting uh, the key finding of my doctoral research, uh, where I followed the development of the Maya Kauai study uh, and the metrics involved in their questionnaire. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, I'm gonna be discussing how indigeneity and indigenous standpoint theory um, are really interesting concepts to apply in epidemiology uh, and how the Mai Kauai study did just that. And I'm gonna talk about the key outcomes and opportunities uh, that applying this knowledge um, can have for other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research projects uh, and other epidemiological projects more broadly. Next slide, please. So indigeneity uh, is a really complex concept that has legal implications and political mobility in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, it's a concept which is, can be essentialist uh, in defining who is Indigenous and who is not, uh, and who decides those things as well. But the way that I have used it, uh, and the way that I think it should be used to be more inclusive and diverse, is to refer to an Indigenous life world, or the lived experience of being an Indigenous person in the world. And Bobby touched on this a little bit um, when she spoke about the Indigenous ways of being, uh, ways of knowing, and ways of doing. Next slide, please. And so essentially, Indigenous standpoint theory is about research uh, conducted from the emic perspective or the insider perspective. Um, and this is opposed to the etic perspective um, upheld by traditional scientific approaches uh, where the outsider or observer is the holder of knowledge and the decider of what matters and what is valued and what should be communicated to the wider world. And some of the key principles um, from Indigenous standpoint theories include a recognition of our worldviews, knowledges and realities as distinctive and important for our existence and survival, honouring our social mores as essential processes, through which we live, learn and situate ourselves on our lands and in the lands of other Indigenous people. It includes an emphasis on social, historical and political contexts which shape our experiences, lives, positions and futures, including settler colonialism. And finally, it privileges the voices, experiences and lives of Indigenous people and Indigenous lands. Next slide. So Mai Kauai um, is a prime example of how an Indigenous standpoint theory and Indigenous perspectives can be incorporated into epidemiological practice. As Ray discussed, um, the Mai Kauai study follows a kind of strengths-based agenda focusing on our assets uh, and what matters to us as defined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, and one of the processes that I observed uh, was the extensive community consultations uh, that the Mike Wire researchers did, primarily through focus groups, in which the concepts and metrics used in their questionnaire were sort of sounded out and formalized uh, through that process. And of course, Mike Wire essentially, uh, its ultimate focus is on serving community needs and interests. Next slide. And here you can see a kind of representation um, of that Indigenous standpoint 
looking at how those cultural domains interact with and influence every aspect of the health experience for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Next slide. And why is this important? Um, well, when I was attending the focus groups, I asked a question at the end of the participants about why they thought people should be participating in these focus groups. And I just wanted to share the response of one participant, uh, which really summarised, I think, what people thought about the process. And they said it starts off with the question that was asked at the beginning of the survey, what cultural things are important to you? And I suppose we all talk about the same things, saving our language, our culture, our cultural practices, our songs, our dance and our stories. That's why we're all sitting around this table because we still want to keep that alive and not let it die off. Plus, we've probably all been around tables like this and to discuss it because we wanna keep that alive and make sure that it is alive 70 years from now and not be a culture that has died because of the westernized way of living. Next slide. And so here are some of the key outcomes and opportunities from incorporating an Indigenous standpoint uh, into epidemiological research. You generate an epidemiological tool which reflects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identified needs. It creates data and knowledge which speaks to our actual um, Indigenous lived experiences. It creates a, res a resource which enfor enforces uh, Indigenous rights, uh, which including Indigenous sovereignty and governance, which Ray spoke about. And finally, it creates research which supports social justice, um, which I know is one reason I got into academia and I hope some of you as well. Next slide, please. And so just to conclude, indigeneity can be a valuable research tool for epidemiological studies. Incorporating Indigenous standpoint theory from the beginning of the research design is essential to achieve this. My Kauai has demonstrated that this is possible uh, within an epidemiological framework and at scale. And interdis interdisciplinary work can help to achieve this. For example, using qualitative methods to inform the development of quantitative metrics. Thank you very much. So it's just on the flash screen. Yeah, uh, top. Yeah, not good one. Yeah, and then if you just sort by date modify, then it'll be earlier. Yeah. Cool. Do you need this to draw? Yeah, okay. And um, while well, the presentation is getting loaded, and that's um, because I was um, just on time or um, on my arrival, I'll just um, start by saying uh, Tenzi, um, Tenzi Atalia, Kakia, Kitam, Skatinawel. Um, Non duetchka in a way does a cause um uh Whitford Lake, um Red River, uh Saskatoon, Chinia, um Nikwan, uh Takaranto. Um so I just uh said uh welcome, uh I greet you all um in my maternal tongue, which is my dialect Cree, um, which I am recovering. Um and uh I always start with uh, putting uh, this picture of the land out because it reminds me uh, to acknowledge country. Um, and so I'm very grateful um, to be a visitor on Nungarwal and uh, in Bear territory. And uh, just forgive me in my stumbling English words, um, but see, as we stumble along um, in, in creating and recreating and regenerating Indigenous ways of knowing and doing, we're stumbling along, I am in English, um, and stumbling along uh, with uh, tools um, that we've always had, um, but then um, uh, different systems um, we need to interface with. Um, so I'm Janet Smiley, and uh, I also talked a little bit about the land that I'm from, uh, Red River, um, the uh, prairies there in the center of Canada. Um, so. Uh, Whitford Lake is a Métis settlement named after one of my ancestors and also um, Saskatoon. Um, but I live in the city of Toronto, which some of us are now calling Takaronto um, because it builds on Indigenous language. So I'm so 
also impressed and grateful to be um, a visiting fellow here at the National um, Center um, for Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing Research here at ANU and totally impressed um, by my colleagues. So one of the good things about being the fourth person on a panel um, when you have such tremendous colleagues is there's not much to say, but perhaps I'll bring a little bit of a different perspective and perhaps there's some things that I can do or say um, when I'm a visitor that um, might push the limits a little more. So I have about 15 minutes and the first thing I'm going to do is just progress the self-location a little bit. And I don't, we don't really know who's out there. Um, and uh, I actually have two questions for you. Um, so hopefully that'll wake you up a little bit. Um, so here we go. So the self-location, then I'm going to talk a little bit about Métis epidemiology, because like many things in health and well-being, I actually think Indigenous people have been at something called epidemiology, but it wouldn't have been called that in Cree, and now I'm going to be on a hunt for the word in my language, because uh, um, I'll, I'll speak a bit about that. We've gone back and forth, but um, in case there are some settler epidemiologists out there, because um, there's lots of them in my home school, I'm going to just quickly talk about some characteristics of colonizing data systems, because in order for us to move this work forward, we can't do it all alone. So we actually need our colleagues to name and look at those roots. And I actually try to look at that too, because I'm in a constant process of decolonizing. And that's why I get so excited, because like some others, I've been at it for a little while. Um, so we get pushed along though. Um, by some of the next generation. So that makes me feel very happy. Um, I do have an example um, of a project that we've done that models many of the notions of Indigenous governance um, and um, governance of data and then data for governance. Um, but it's got a focus um, on attending to health assessment and response for First Nations, Inuit and Métis people living in urban and related homelands in Canada because we don't have any sampling frame we've had to adapt. And then I wanna say a couple words about NEC. And then hopefully we can um, get through the discussion. So as I'm self-locating, um, and this is an important thing because the way I think about who I am as a Métis woman, it's about who I'm related to. Um, and that includes my human relations, but also my land relations. And again, you'll find that relationality, and that's one of the best bits, I think, about working in Indigenous health research is we build those relationships more or less over time. Um, but I have an unbroken um, maternal Métis kin line, and we're matrilineal. So there's my mom, Mavis, born uh, Mavis Whitford, and then um, her mother, Ruby, born Ruby Whitford, and then her mother, Marguerite Sauvé. Um, and that Whitford kid line, we can trace right back to England. Easier to follow some of the um, settler names. Um, Marguerite Sauvé, my um, maternal kin line actually goes right up into um, Cree territory. Um, and then just so you know, because as we travel, um, like uh, you'll know, some of you might know about the Indian Act we have in Canada and the treaties, um, but fewer people even in Canada know about this half-breed um, script commission. Um, and so then not to go too far back into my ancestry, but it's just to show you this is half-breed script. Um, mm -hmm. So we had three tiers of the Indian Act. So the idea was to actually break us apart a little bit. Um, some scholars say that apartheid in South Africa um, was built on the Indian Act. Um, so there was um, a desire then to also try to assimilate, particularly First Nations women, um, particularly if they married Métis um, or white men. Um, so that's... Um, uh, Marguerite Sylvie's great grandmother, Nancy Le Bon. So she sold her um, treaty. She signed away her treaty for $113. And she was part of this Edmonton Stragglers Band. And there's a little story, and I don't want to digress too much because my colleagues have been so respectful of the time. And I really want to build a discussion if we have time. Um, but the bit of story here is that Nancy Le Bon, then my um, one of my root ancestors was from a band called the Edmonton Stragglers. But because I grew up out of territory and this notion of stragglers, I was a little ashamed of this name because I was growing up in Ontario and there's many big First Nations of the Grand River. And um, But anyways, one day I was sitting at my kitchen table and this is why it's so important that we get to have discussions and yarning. Um, and I'm very fortunate that um, 
one of my aunties is a really well-respected Métis elder and historian, and she said, oh, the stragglers. And it turns out, um, so Nancy Lebon was part of this Papa Chase band. Um, Papa Chase means woodpecker um, in Cree. And in fact, um, she was one of these 84 band members who are actually um, of current interest to um, Indigenous and Métis historians because they actually rebelled a little bit um, and were um, pushing back um, against the Indian agent because um, people weren't keeping their treaty promises. The other thing is the straggler word, and again, this gets to the deficit versus strength-based because I thought, oh, stragglers, that must like be a weak name. Mm. But in fact, my auntie and the way we reframe things, she said, oh, they were the good hunters and gatherers because part of Treaty 6 signing was to try to starve us out. So the stragglers were the last ones to come in because they could survive um, for longer. So hopefully some of that feisty resilience sticks with me. And then I think it is important and, you know, um, hold your hats if you're a non-Indigenous person, because in a minute, I'm going to ask you to go through your own self-location exercise, just to let you know, because we're doing this Indigenous governance thing. And we need to understand where we're going to self-locate. And I don't think it's dichotomous, but, you know, I also um, have a European kinline. So I share bloodlines with Europeans. Um, and this is my father, Douglas Edwin Smiley. And I always feel um, a bit honored when I'm here at ANU because he was a visiting scholar here at ANU, um, I guess when I was 15 years old. So that would be just a little while ago. <laughs> okay, so in case you are falling asleep, and again, um, maybe the next time we present on a panel together, I can make this a poll, but if you fell asleep, I'm gonna ask everybody just to take a minute and choose an identity category. for me to be quiet for a minute. <laughs> okay, and we can't see it. And sometimes people don't want to answer the question or we have a chat function and feel free to use the chat. We can look at it after in the discussion. But one thing is like in academic environments, we're actually um, often, um, so you can put your answer in the chat in academic environments um, and other professional environments, we actually don't ask about identity. Um, and it could be viewed as a human rights violation, but actually when we're working with Indigenous people in healthcare or research, the Indigenous people always get to self-identify. All my colleagues have self-identified, so how can we really progress like Indigenous sovereignty if we don't know where we sit? And I always say there's more than enough work for everybody, right? Um, I just say that um, because of the um, structured inequities, we need Indigenous people in leadership positions. Um, so we just have to figure out how do we self-locate. Another thing my Auntie Maria says is we all hold a piece of the puzzle. So where is our puzzle and where will we best sit um, to do so good? So thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, and again, if you don't like your word, think about that too, right? Um, and you can, because um, yeah, there's a lot of history for all the settlers there. I'm not sure Black descendant of transatlantic slave trade is the language that people would like. So educate me and we can find out good names, but also self-locate. Um, so maybe I'll see if I can progress now to the next slide. I don't know if we have to close the chat. You can try. I have lost. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So next step is just epidemiology. So. Um, I was actually um, writing up the little um, bio for this, and then now I've de I'm developing a definition of Métis quote epidemiology, because I'll go back to the language speakers that I get to work with and see what they come up with. Um, but John Last, a dear um, Canadian um, epidemiologist, wrote a dictionary of epidemiology. I know when I was just finishing my own epi training, I met him. So the study of the distribution and determinants of health related states or events in specified populations and the application of this study to the control of health problems. Okay, but so here we go. And so then we're Buffalo people as Métis. So again, these are um, not the best drawings. I always make the joke though, that's me on a bad day, me just in the <laughs> on the ground. Okay, so I got a little laugh. Um, and then the hard work actually came after the Buffalo work caught. It was dangerous. And we actually had um, like some showmanship and stuff and um, actually very firm and structured laws to our Buffalo hunt as Métis people. But here, imagine the hard work is like um, harvesting the Buffalo. I know I was going to a culture camp once and my lodge sister said, oh, let's do a Buffalo. And I was like, no, no, no. I think that's going to be too much work. And I confirmed that with my auntie. Um, but just to show, and then we used every single part of the buffalo. So really, 
um, who we are on the prairies um, has to do with the buffalo. So here we go, we start thinking about traditional ecologic knowledge. So my people actually, part of um, why um, we lost a war with Canada um, and part of how we were defeated um, is we contributed to our own demise, but we didn't um, continue to track the health and well-being of the buffalo. But where I come from on those flatlands, I actually don't think we could have survived unless we were excellent empirical trackers. So this is just a working definition about what Indigenous community planning and Métis epidemiology must be. And I think it has some parallels to last systems. It's just a bit more holistic. Always think, you know, the World Health Organization definition of health at Alma Ada, perhaps it was influenced by the Indigenous people I know that were present. So here we're actually saying, and maybe this is really important for like public health 3.0, the one that um, if we follow it will help us get out of this um, dilemma that we've created as human beings, right? So that we're thinking about the relationships between all things, human, animals, plants, our ecosystems. And when we do our ceremony, we talk about all our relations, analyzing patterns. And it reminds me of, that's why Maya Kauai is so amazing because it's looking more broadly, right? At these things. Then we make conclusions, predictions. One of my uncles said, you know, the Cree, we had about a five-year planning cycle translate into collective action, social systems and our policies are natural laws to enhance holistic well-being, not only for us as individuals or human collectives, um, but for um, our lived environment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more then um, about um, the challenges in current epidemiology and the conversation has advanced. But um, just, I thought I would put this up because it was in the slide set and um, some of you know Dr. Ian Anderson. So he was very kind to me in my second Canadian Institutes of Health Research grant. Um, so these publications um, were put on the Anemda website in um, I think 2002, 2003. Um, so basically, we were just looking at how Indigenous people were involved in data production and use. Okay, so the challenge is um, that at that time, we weren't really involved at all in data production and use. Um, so now we have research like My Apply, Our Health Counts, and also the Trailblazing First Nations Regional Health Survey, which really, um, like, uh, kick things off and which I followed very closely. I got a chance to work with them, see what they do, um, borrow from their survey tool as we developed our health counts for urban and related homelands. Um, but basically, and again, um, I'm gonna just give two examples um, because I want us to have some discussion, but another question is coming in. Part of it is how is the data work that you're doing um, different or perpetuating some of these things? So. These are some characteristics of colonizing data systems that I think we have to root out at the same time as we create our own Indigenous governed data systems. And it's good we could have, um, like, and maybe part of the work of rooting out these characteristics is, is for our settler colleagues. Um, but maintain control through involuntary counting and tracking, and you'll see in a moment, that's what's happened to Indigenous people, even that half-read script, the Indian Act, like those things were involuntary. Right, protect this control by monopolizing ownership and access to measurement systems. So all those times in Indigenous communities when we want our data, but we can't even get it. That happened a lot during COVID. People were tracking our COVID outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think Ray was involved in a paper on that, dictating who and what will be counted. So some of the you that know me well, I'm quite passionate because quite often our, all of our constitutionally recognized people are not included in the count. They count the Indian Act Indians, but they don't count the relatives, which are my mob or um, the Indian Act Indians when they move into cities um, and then purposely and systematically undercount or discount. So again, um, we found um, that there's an undercounting in cities in Canada by a factor of two to four. Um, and that helps maintain then an unequal distribution of health and social resources. And then they're structured to main or, uh, maintain authority over what is a valid count method or system. That's why the culture-based indicators um, that Maya Kauai is developing and validating are so critical um, because those are things that matter to Indigenous people. But um, I'm imagining that at times, um, just like I've been told, well, what I'm studying or measuring isn't real science, right? Um, that there's those kind of barriers. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, just sit with that. I'm, I think we could actually go through all of these and have an academic discussion. I'm wired to be a person that's full of passion. 
um, but I'm happy to engage. So here's just two quick examples. I have a whole talk that kind of drills down, but with the involuntary counting and tracking, of course, some, this has happened to Indigenous people um, where there was experiments and like actually involuntary biologic samples. And this is a historic example from our residential schools, which was quite shocking, um, but it can really, I think there's a continuum um, where it can happen. And I even constantly try to surveil and reflect on my own research to make sure I'm not falling into that trap. And then here, just because people aren't sure, like in Canada, there's our Indian Act still exists. Um, so a 150 year old piece of legislation where um, like external to indigenous community people are still defining. And that slide 6162 equals, you know, um, like 61 plus no status equals 6262 no status equals no status. That was actually taken from an Indian Affairs presentation. And my own family is a microcosm of the Indian Act. So basically, this is a purposeful recipe to assimilate us all, because eventually, um, if we marry out, um, and then there's just an example of um, one of our status cards. You can see that. And then you can just see, so this is a dated slide, but I um, created it for a paper that I wrote a long time ago, just in case you're very interested in all the technical um, challenges with um, uh, the gaps in quality health and social statistics for Indigenous people in Canada. So you can actually see the key point here is usually only about half of our population is counted. In. And it's hard for me to imagine this is our Nas National Statistics Agency, National um, Public Health Agency, that they would do that for any other ethnic population. Right? Like just leave out like a large country in Asia when they were um, producing um, Asian statistics. Um, so some of these slides, it's easy to make pictures, but basically what we get to often then is Indigenous community and then there's gatekeepers keeping community away from the data. So instead with Mayaquai, we see um, the Mayaquai team building bridges for community into the data. Um, and then we've heard already lots about data governance, but this is one of my favorite quotes, um, Marlene Brandt Castellano, an amazing um, Mohawk elder who did a lot of the um, heavy lifting for some of our ethics in Canada. So just to remind people why we're so passionate about this um, is it's actually part of self-determination um, to be able to, um, and I think Sarah, you said that nicely in your slide as well, how important it is to have this continuity of culture. So if we're allowing other people to count us um, and measure us um, using tools that don't make sense to us and often are a mismeasure of us, um, then um, how can, what do we have to pass on to our children in 70 years? Um, so this is kind of where we want to get to with community in the middle, the governing community partners, right, um, who are actually um, holding um, community data. You could think about health information of Indigenous people kind of as a sacred social resource. Um, that's how I sometimes speak about it. Okay, so I just want to take a few more. Oh, here's another question then. So just for you to reflect on. So how do the data sets you're working with include or exclude the people who the data was collected from? So I use this in some of, I get to teach an advanced um, CLINEPI seminar, I think, to our graduate students at U of T. Um, and yeah, a lot of times people feel badly after they're like, oh, I didn't think about like talking directly to the people, but what are the implications with respect to structured social inequities? Um, so I might just show this one slide about our health counts and then I'll show one slide about the our health counts net because I think um, some people might have to go at one. I think some of us can stick around for a bit of a discussion. Um, but basically, we've done this study six times now, um, and um, we're trying to build um, longitudinal data for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis living in urban and related homelands. We were able to pivot it during COVID, and I think um, be producing some of the only data in Canada for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis living in urban and related homelands. Um, and we actually used respondent driven sampling because the big dilemma is um, in Canada overall, we have four identifiers of First Nations, Inuit and Métis and all of our source data sets. And for those living in cities, there's actually um, no sample um, that we could randomly sample from. So it's a bit labor intensive, um, but the bonus is that you build in community participation 
And we've been able to show urban undercounts, as I mentioned before, um, that are um, showing that there's actually two to four times more Indigenous people living in multiple cities in Ontario. And we are actually able then to build that into national vaccine planning um, because the federal government actually didn't have any idea how many urban Indigenous people there were, even though they're 50% of our population. So they asked my research team kind of overnight to just come up with an estimate. So um, we did our best. Um, so they're large RDS studies. Um, it's very strength-based um, because um, we use our community social network. So that's one of the things I love is when we find a strength in Indigenous community and can build our research around that. Um, and then this strong, I think a common myth is in urban areas um, that um, we don't have a strong sense of Indigenous cultural identity, but um, we found actually there was a very strong sense of identity. Okay, so a couple thoughts about Indigenous EPI training, um, and I heard um, Dr. Lovett mention it as well, um, in terms of trying to build the capacity, and that's part of the work I'm trying to do while I'm here at ANU um, and in Australia. So we have a time-sensitive need to address a paucity of First Nations and Uta Métis epidemiologists and health service researchers in Canada. I wrote in 2006, I thought there was only 20 of us with graduate level, like even master's level training. I think we probably doubled that, but um, it's still um, really... Um, a small workforce. Um, so we're looking at a graduate level certificate, maybe building to a degree. Um, we want to have people staying in um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis and urban organizations that could be primary sponsors um, and then have a combination of distance and face-to-face -face training intensives. Um, and so I have large um, like uh, First Nations, um, Inuit and Métis um, governing partners that are very interested in this. Um, so we're um, trying to see if there could be some international synergies. And the vision, right, is that we would actually customize the curriculum um, so that we would build on the premise that um, as um, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, Indigenous people coming with lived and work experience, there's already a big skill set and tradition right, of empirical observation um, analysis and making conclusions. So um, we can kind of address um, this myth that we're not good at counting or good at math um, because we wouldn't have made it this far if we weren't. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Um, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to share with you. How do I turn on the chat? Mm -hmm. So people can ask the questions. Yeah. Um, so that concludes the sort of formal presentations. We do have some time now uh, for um, questions. Basically, if they raise their hand, I can unmute them. Yep. Um, so if you'd like to uh, ask a question, um, just raise your hand and we can unmute you. I'm sure Dr. Raglan Maddox must have a question. <laughs> Raglan back with us. No, no. Yeah. He's probably on. He probably might people. be busy at a meeting. Mm. Yeah, no, it's just, it's right outside. Um, alternative way you can just uh, put it in the uh, chat function as well. Does anybody want to put in the chat function? Like, oh, good. Okay. Yes. Okay, you should be able to talk. Great, Thank you. Thank you. Health. Sorry, and where were you from? ACT Health. Oh, okay. Um, just uh, and I recently moved over from um, housing ACT and one of the issues was often in you know developing data collections um, uh, you know while we had a tenant consultancy group that we tried to get a real um, a mix of people including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members um, it would have been sometimes really great to have actually an advisory group to go to um, and I'm thinking particularly to address some of the things that were the, the issues that were brought up in the slides about um, 
about, you know, sometimes inadvertently by the way that we collect data, we can, um, uh, you know, fail to pick up Indigenous status, you know, and a common mistake is not to include um, uh, it, um, a, a field, say, for, for missing or not stated or does not wish to answer. And so actually what you get is that people, you know, analysts might just tell you, yes, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but um, they're not even recording the no's. They're just kind of like it's either no or didn't answer. And so that's kind of, it's you know, it, it's a... It's, uh, it's a terrible day, way, way to treat your data, but it also has that effect of um, uh, losing information. And um, so, there, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking there are there are data standard practices that can support um, uh, not just not just uh, better data, but in that that data that properly reflects um, the views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but having um, and advisory groups, like known advisory groups to go to would be a real bonus here. And I just want to get your views on, you know, how, how do we find um, the right advice and, and, you know, where do we go to and does we, do we have enough infrastructure, I guess, um, for for government to, to find advisory groups or, you know, what do you think is the best practice there? Um, so I know our data sovereignty group um, does not recommend advisory groups, uh, particularly in relation to um, data collections, because they're, they're quite problematic. And in fact, he sort of highlighted an interesting kind of aspect there where, um, you know, there are data standards. So one, what I know from uh, a number of different pieces of work is that settlers don't follow the data standards, particularly in relation to Indigenous status, uh, because they're usually too scared to ask indigeneity, um, even though it's often mandated. So I, know, I found this in hospital studies. Um, and then those systems, as you rightly point out, have default options. So the default option in most medical um, software is not stated. Uh, coded nine in medical director, I think, is one of the yeah. common ones that are used by about 85% of GPs here in Australia. Um, so those systems are highly problematic in that they're default options. And then we've got this additional sort of human um, uh, interaction problem. Um, but, um, you know, this advice and advice around Indigenous data standards have, uh, has been in place for a long time. So one of the things um, that we strongly advocate, so the ACT would be a perfect jurisdiction to do this, is well, what do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living here need from the data systems? So that's the point I'm going back to for Indigenous data sovereignty. We keep defaulting to who do I talk to to help me out? It's the wrong approach. It's that this needs to be driven by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, what do they need in terms of housing information? And I bet you my bottom dollar that if you engaged Aboriginal people in that process about what data is important for your housing, family and circumstances, um, and that those people got to control the data story and the processes around that, you would get very different results. But you need to set those structures up. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to... Um agree with Ray and just like you've pointed out a really important problem and so it's a good question the problem being that at point of service delivery um, like you'll get an Indigenous undercount um, particularly once you start getting to hospitalization for example because um, it could actually harm you to self-identify as Indigenous. The example I wanted to share from Toronto um, and Ontario is actually, there is a big movement and Toronto is a very diverse city. It's a, like, so um, actually we have um, a large black and um, racialized population in addition to a large indigenous population, but the in issues for indigenous self-identification, there's some crossover, but it differs from racialized populations. So because we've um, actually um, 
have survived by passing if we can. And we often get misclassified as other racial groups um, and that feels safer. So during COVID, um, like in public health, also another place where it's not been safe because they've been complicit like in like inappropriate um, family service interventions and, and family breakdown. Um, so I think I identified about nine things that would have to happen for an Indigenous person to get correctly self-identified as Indigenous, like during COVID, as having COVID. Um, and Toronto Public Health and um, our community partners were working on the data. I think my, my, our estimate is that they were only correctly um, classifying about one out of 10 Indigenous people with COVID. So it actually had some real-time implications because they could see that there was higher infection rates among black and racialized communities, but it looked like indigenous people just weren't getting infected, mm -hmm. but it was because people were not getting correctly identified as indigenous. So instead we partnered. So we created a partnership with two well-known indigenous service agencies and collected our own database and used the Our Health Counts database. So then we could show that. So again, not only is it important from a governance and like sovereignty perspective? It's actually just important from a practical perspective because you're always going to get undercounts and a biased sample um, if you're an external agency asking about Indigenous identity, in my experience, particularly in urban contexts. So I don't know, Rick, if that is a helpful um, example. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, it talks to a point where, you know, the safety of the environment where people are identifying uh, is paramount. So for certain systems and particularly government agencies, um, people may not feel safe. Uh, we have a question about this in my choir actually about where, where you choose or not to identify as Indigenous. Um, so yeah, that absolutely plays into it, particularly in the urban areas. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful, Anne. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, that's um, yeah, I mean, yeah, essentially you're saying, um, yeah, from the start, to really yeah. um, work work with the community. Yeah. Yep. Questions in the chat? Ginny. Ginny, do you want to um, ask your question in the chat? Are you able to unmute Ginny? Yeah, just speaking. Should we go to, good to go, Ginny? Hello, everyone. Thanks for such a wonderful session. Really enjoyed your talks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Terrific. It's just so insightful hearing all of your perspectives. And I hear loud and clear the Indigenous perspective and being an Indigenous researcher is so central. And as a non-Indigenous researcher, I'd just love some guidance and advice from you on how I can be involved in Indigenous research. Do you want me to take a stab at it and then you can... Sure. Yeah, so I'll tell you, Ginny, what we do um, in among my circle, like uh, with community partners, like in um, Toronto at the Well Living House, is if somebody reaches out, right, um, then like we meet with them, right? Um, so I might meet with them or my community partners that are very research engaged and um, some have faculty appointments might meet with them just to see. Um, but I'm a big believer like in reciprocity and I frame that like research is almost a gift exchange. So um, depending if you meet with a person, depending on um, like what kind of background they might have, what kind of skill set they might have in Indigenous community engagement, right? Like um, often we can find them work to do because there's more than enough work for everybody. Um, and the reciprocity is that then they get to learn experientially like about the way we do our work. Cause I don't really think there's any other way, like you could read it in a book, but actually to learn how to do community engaged, community partner work um, for me um, requires um, actually like some time. So it's interesting because I've been having dialogue with some of my um, colleagues outside of my unit and they're like, oh, can you come do a brown bag seminar? 
like on how to do it. And I'm like, no, but if you want to volunteer on my research team, like for a couple of months, um, then you can start to learn. Right. And again, we all hold a piece of the puzzle. So not everybody might fit, you know, into the well living house team, but we can almost always find out space. So um, yeah, that's a little bit of a piece. There's an excellent article too that I was sharing um, that we might be able to get up on the chat, like uh, that came from colleagues up in Queensland. Um, so I'll, I've been carrying it around. I don't think I have it in hand, um, but uh, yeah, it also talks about what contributions can non-Indigenous researchers make to Indigenous health research. So I'll look that up. Maybe we'll raise the answer and we can write it in the chat. Terrific. Thanks very much. Sarah or Bobby, did you want to add? Oh, you can go, right? <laughs> I, I guess um, one of the things that I uh, happens to me quite a bit, um, so it's more a personal reflection, is I often get approached about someone that's ha that has had an idea for research. And, um, you know, they obviously think it's a really good idea, but they're wanting me to... Um, uh, facilitate that research for them. Um, so my suggestion would be to not proceed that way, um, but really think about whether those that idea or um, uh, is a priority for you know the different community or um, area that um, you, you know. Um, or different groups that you might want to engage with. So there's a whole bunch of um, strategies, particularly NHMRC and other areas that uh, sort of lay out uh, priority areas for Indigenous research and ARC as well. Um, so my guess would be to start there with your idea and then, you know, finding people, as Janet's indicated, that are doing that kind of work, um, but definitely not coming in saying, I'm going to solve everything. If you help me out, uh, I think that's kind of the wrong approach. The number of times that I'm imagining this is to foray that I've been contacted and somebody has their grant almost all ready yeah. to go. They just need me to kind of introduce them. We feel like a dating person, <laughs> like to an Indigenous community. And uh, yeah, so yeah. Um, I don't do that. I don't think that's so helpful. It's a very, um, these relationships, right? Mm. My auntie used to say we can't do anything with anyone until we have like a relationship with them. So even when Europeans arrived on the East Coast, and that's like we intermarried then and shared children, right? Like it's, um, you're developing like a kin relationship. Yeah. So I can't do that by an email introduction. And I'm sure, Jenny, thank you for the question because I'm sure that's not what you're implying. And thank you, Emily, for putting the article up. I feel like um, we're doing a good job here because Emily and I have been having a discussion about this very issue. Leonie, I think we're fixed. Yeah. Leonie, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Thanks, sure. Panel. I've got a question. I'm sorry, it's going to be a two-pronged question. Um, one is about the take-up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander epidemiologists in the ATCHO context. Uh, do we know much about what the rate is of um, and if there's, we don't, we're not aware of many, um, what are some of the barriers or limitations or potential benefits of trying to change that um, workforce a bit, presence in ad shows. And the other one was just about the, you know, the categories of um, epidemiology, you know, between infectious disease epidemiology, chronic epidemiology and social epidemiology. How do you see that interacting or, you know, perhaps limiting um, Indigenous epidemiology in the context that you've spoken of it today? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Dorothy Gibson. Uh, Leona is one of my current uh, applied FE students. Um, so I'll have a go at this. I, there has been a real desire, I think, uh, particularly in the last 20 years, to have a higher uptake of FE uh, or epidemiology training in the community control sector. So that's our, our very large um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health organisations. Uh, in Australia, of which there's about 140 across the country. Um, I think some real barriers to that. Uh, so I did part of my epidemiology training, actually, in a, in a community control context, in that it's been talked about, um, and it relates to the second part of your question, actually, 
is that the big focus of most of the epi training in Australia is actually on infectious diseases. Um, you know, in given COVID and the current situation um, over the last couple of years, you can see why um, that, that may have happened and uh, in the context of the past as well. Um, but the uptake hasn't been high, but I think part of the reason for that, and Janet's alluded to it as well in her presentation, is that it's, it begins here at a master's level. Um, when, so I personally, I think that's, that's highly problematic um, and why I do a lot of the work I do around data literacy um, and practice. So a lot of that is heavily based on uh, epi notions. Um, so I think we should be, um, we should have a whole range of epi training uh, from that understanding of, of uh, the words and the language we use in epi right through to uh, micro simulation model, you know, modeling and those sorts of things, quite complex um, kind of areas. So I think uh, that's why we haven't seen a huge uptake. I reckon in the next few years, we might see some further uptake there because people are coming to realize when there's a, a worldwide health emergency that epi is really important in that particular context. But if we look at, um, you know, in the Indigenous context, what's going on in terms of health and wellbeing outcomes. Um, yes, there's absolutely infectious diseases, but chronic diseases, um, the whole sort of um, um, health and wellbeing landscape. Um, and again, you know, looking at health promoting behaviours as well is part of epidemiology, which we haven't talked about. Um, there is a really wide range of opportunity for epidemiology uh, in Indigenous epidemiology, particularly in the community. So I think uh, that's part of that. I think the categories of epi, there are huge, there is a wide variety of categories uh, in epi training. I've made my views known about the current epi training in Australia being very narrowly focused on infectious diseases, some, some on uh, chronic disease, uh, but I am an advocate of social epi as well, um, social and cultural epi and that we need to expand those areas as well. Um, so if we have the current framework around training, if we expand that and we also expand at the same time, the different types of epi training, I think that would be a good approach. Yeah, I think that um, the Metis epi in quotes, I almost put in a bit about the paradigm or the worldview. So the big problem, I think, with a lot of classic epi training is it's theoretically vacant. So then it by default has kind of a positivist um, worldview um, and then a biomedical kind of deficit based orientation. So I think actually, and now we see it emerging in the literature that we actually bring indigenous paradigms to epidemiology. That's why it's a Métis epidemiology. So um, people who are trained in social epidemiology um, will be able to help because at least they have a knowledge of what a paradigm or a theory is and why it might be important. You know, I'm just um, working on revisions to a COVID paper and it's interesting because it actually showed um, that, um, and this is public every week, the community partners, seventh generation midwives, Harlem told me I can freely share this because it helps us. The rates of testing for indigenous people in Toronto were slightly higher than the general population. We're a bit underpowered because of all the um, infrastructure issues, but actually the rates of infection um, like uh, are comparable. So then initially people were saying, well, you must be wrong. And it's like, but we had a whole bunch of responses. So what if there's actually a strength-based thing? So the outcome is that we actually had way less COVID than we might have based on like chronic diseases. So I frame that a little bit. So it's not a full strength-based approach, but yeah, we definitely need to get beyond like um, this um, deficit-based story about our people. One of the slides that I skipped um, is a lovely quote. Um, so when I was asked to be an expert witness at the National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, um, I was told to maybe um, by my elder and um, a community to talk about a strength-based um, perspective. So um, there's a quote by um, Scott Momaday on the slides, like, um, and so why is it important, right? Because we are who we imagine ourselves to be. 
Um, and I was thinking um, one of my very first international trips at Pacific Region Indigenous Doctors Conference, Dr. Mason Drury gave a talk. And I remember being um, so inspired because he talked about thriving Indigenous communities. That's what we want. We want the whole world to be thriving, like generative, um, like uh, health services, um, which would help us um, advance attachment between all things, right? Um, so there's a real generative aspect and Indigenous models can provide us with that and paradigms. So um, to me, we're missing out if we're just like talking about how prone we are to acute infectious mm. diseases. Mm. Um, so, And the other thing that I just want to add, like whilst when I was doing the MAE, um, one of my projects was an outbreak project up in a community in Queensland and really working with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health worker workforce is um, kind of an opportunity to build that capability as well because they already have these existing skills that um, are really, you know, important and bring assets to field epidemiology work. Sarah might have a particular take on epi yes. training, yes. which I'd be fascinated by, Sarah. We need more coal people. <laughs> <laughs> we can all be friends. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, at the very first gathering that the Institute of Indigenous Peoples Health had, then the Institute of Aboriginal Peoples Health in Canada, um, actually Jeff Redding, other scientific directors were bringing together all the full professors, but Jeff Redding brought together all the students. Um, and we talked and we talked about the need for mixed methods, right? And it's partly because um, we need to have like people who are well-trained like in humanities, right? Um, and um, qualitative methods so that we can nurture and, and make space for and correctly operationalize um, our worldviews, which are diverse and sophisticated as indigenous peoples. And Jim is gonna cut his acara. Kara, would you like to ask a question? I think you had Hello. Yep, I would. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentations. They've been quite an eye opener. So my question's around uh, one of the slides you had where you um, suggested that the data point is not the most important uh, aspect for the endpoint and that the relationships between the data points were more important. So from someone who's quite uh, quant based, how do you begin to unravel that or how do you start to access that? Yeah, so I think that might have been my slide and it brings me, I think it might have been the same Marlene Brandt Castellano that I was quoting. We were sitting in um, some kind of gathering and it must have been more than 20 years ago and we were talking about relationality and how the relationship between the data bits is just as important as the data itself. And I think if you think about like um, traditional ecologic knowledge and systems on the land, right? Like I think I'm not a ecologist, but I think that um, even um, the sciences of ecology talk about the interrelationships between things. So if we just think about narrow outcomes and not the interconnections between them, um, then yeah, we don't do a very good job of survival, right? Like uh, and. For me, um, you know, in terms of my cultural teachings and the um, ceremony lodge I've been a part of, this um, notion of Wakota win, right, which is kin relationships, but it's, again, relationships between all things, but we start with the relationships um, between, like, our, our kin relatives and how to keep those strong, like, distributing knowledge, distributing skills, right, um, making sure that everybody had a role um, when one is living on a landscape that changes all the time um, would be really important. So there's others that could be more articulate than me um, as to why across diverse indigenous worldviews or paradigms, the relationship between things is just as important, if not more important than like the individual level outcomes. But it seems to be a recurrent theme um, in my limited understanding, it's because um, that is what um, our lived environment is all about. So 
Um, you can't change one thing as we're learning with global warming um, <laughs> in the like a lived environment and not have multiple ramifications. So you need to think about those things in balance. And again, if you just thought about how the World Health Organization in the 1960s expanded beyond just physical health to think about emotional um, and uh, social and, and spiritual and mental health, um, maybe that would, so our bio, even our biomedical models can't deny it. Maybe that's a way to start getting your head around that. Um, one good thing is as we advance in terms of the actual technologies um, and our ability to model, um, we can start thinking about those things in more sophisticated manners um, than we did um, when I started my EPI training a little while back. And I'm happy if others want to respond to that. Maybe Sarah Bork has something good to say on that. <laughs> Put her on the spot. Uh I, I can I can um, respond to some of the methodological uh, or methods limitations in EPI. Um, you know, we even in some of the work we're doing in my why it's very you know we can look at exposure outcome um, mediators and moderators, right? Um, so, but most people never even get to that point um, where they just we're just looking at data points, um, saying, well, if we could do this, this is the outcome. Where we've started heading is well, if that's the app, you know, if that's the relationship, uh, the association, then you know, there's some of the there's really important other factors that we haven't measured before that might be mediating or moderating those relationships. And so we're now able to do some of that work, but going much further beyond that, Epi is really limited. Like, and um, you know, so that's hard as well. What if you've got and you can do multivariable. Uh, kind of approaches as well, but you know, there's still lots of limitations in EPI. So we can't answer all the questions we want to answer, I think is the other, uh, the other part of that, because we are limited by the methods we have available. And why coal mm. is important, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to add that um, incorporating those mixed methods, qualitative research can help fill in some of that contextual background information and knowledge. Um, that's really important. And I think if you're thinking, um, oh no, it's important to get lots of data points, um, just speaking, thinking about those limitations of doing that. Um, for example, you know, if you do an interview with someone talking about their health and well being over an hour or two hours, that is such a rich source of information. It's not just an answer to a couple of questions on a survey. It's, you know, about their family, about their lives, about where they live. And I think that sort of information can work really well um, in tandem with uh, epidemiological data. There's that question, Ray, that's been there for a while in, this, uh, in the chat. From Helen. She's just put her hand up. Yeah, well. Helen, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Um, look, it seems to me that the domains that you're using in the MK study are really bringing a, a challenge to some of the um, uh, studies that look more broadly at the Australian population, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I'm just wondering if you found any opportunities to um, bring that more relational and um, environmental-based thinking into the way that governments might be um, using epidemiological um, data in developing frameworks, <clears throat> which uh, tend to be very much more individualistic. It seems to me that you that this study has a lot to teach. Uh, thanks for the question. It does come up. Uh, I had a meeting yesterday, actually, with ACT government, and this question did come up um, in that uh, there's a big move across lots of governments to um, implement what they call or calling wellbeing budgets or wellbeing strategies. So I know the ACT is one of those jurisdictions. Um, but when, um, when I was presented with the model, it had the person, the individual at the centre. And my response was, well, you know, that's great. Um, 
but conceptually that's um, problematic uh, for most Indigenous populations or other groups that are very collectivist, I guess, I guess would be the term, um, in that, yes, you're an individual, but you might, you're also part of a family, you're also part of a community. And so you've got these different levels that we should be looking at. So I've definitely talked about it. Uh, but there's a lot of work for me to do in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space. So if other non-Indigenous people and other groups want to take that up kind of in their sort of society, that would be fantastic. Mm. Mm. Uh, lots of government people on the line today. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we're nice. all part of communities and families. Like, yeah. um, but that. Uh, and kinship networks. So we're talking about, you know, very specific kinds of family networks and social groups uh, in a particular context. But, you know, um, we, we don't, we're not an island, um, each mm. person. Mm. I would just like to add too that um, there's been quite a few, uh, like a growing momentum or recognition behind the fact that culture um, is kind of like a missing link in health research. And there's actually a paper by that title I'll just share in the chat. Um, but it's really poorly measured internationally, often like language group or nationality or, you know, religion are used as proxy measures of cultural background. But as we know, that uh, doesn't tell you very much about people. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity to look into culture and build up cultural models for use in epidemiological research. Thank you. Okay, we're at time, I think. Is there one more? Ah, that's Sarah. Um, we did get a question about um, will the recording be made available? It's fine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's fine with you guys. It's yeah, fine. If it, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's fine with uh, the group, so we can make the recording available. It'll probably be on our new centre's website uh, soon when that gets put up. Uh, we're currently, we're currently developing, um, you know, our new centre's uh, web page, so we'll make sure that that's available under the seminars tab. Uh, when that goes up on the new website, so we'll put that there. Um, thanks to my um, co-panelists for your presentations and contributions today. Um, I think this is actually our centre's first formal seminar and panel, so it's good to be on the first one. Um, keep an eye out uh, if you want to stay on our uh, list for future seminars. Um, Michaela will um, uh, uh, probably email bomb everyone uh, in the future for our next uh, seminar. So thanks for your participation today and we'll close off there. Thanks everyone. Hi, hi.